I went through it this morning. <coughs> Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Evo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us. Today we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today we are in 1 Timothy, and we will be in chapter 2. So if you want to grab your Bible, a cup of coffee highlighter, pencil or pen, so you can mark up your word, please go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and pray. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for being gracious, having faith in you, Lord God, in heaven. We're asking that you would lead us today, guide us every step of the way, Father. And Lord, the challenges that we have, the frustrations that we have when things aren't working the way they, we feel they should be working, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would take over and give us wisdom, Lord, and give us patience, Father. And let us just lay all these things before you, Father. Lord, as we begin our day, we begin it, Father, asking that you will minister to us and maybe just share a word with us, Lord, right where we're at, Lord. We're all individuals and we're all in different places in our life. And today's message will, will touch all of us uh, where God wants it to touch us, Lord, on whatever issues we're dealing with, Lord. So we're expecting you, Lord, to speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning again. Dina, glad you could join us. Let's see who else. Okay. Well, at least there's one of you joining us today. So we're in chapter 2, Dina, of um, Timothy. If you want to grab your Bible. Now, Paul says in verse 1 of chapter 2, Therefore, so in light of what he said earlier in chapter 1, all the challenges that uh, he had and Timothy had, the, the warfare that they were in. And so he says, therefore, I exhort you. Uh, I exhort, first of all, that supplication, prayer, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. So <clears throat> he's encouraging the believers and Timothy to be prayer warriors. He's encouraging them not to battle in the flesh, but to battle in the spirit, to battle in prayer. Paul tells the Ephesian believers that we don't fight against powers and principalities of the air, or, or we don't fight against flesh and blood, we fight against powers and principalities of the air. And so it is a spiritual warfare, and spiritual warfare means spiritual weapons. And one of the best weapons that we as believers have is prayer. And it's one that's not utilized as much as we, we should. It's interesting that, that we this year decided to, by the Lord's leading, to have a Saturday night prayer. We've, we've really never done that before. We used to have prayer nights, I believe, on Monday nights. And it was usually at someone's house. And they would actually uh, cook dinner for everyone. And we'd get a good 10, 15 people there. And, and, and I think it was once a month. And we'd get together and we pray and eat and fellowship and so forth but this is the first time that we decided that we're just going to take every Saturday at 6 30 and just pray and have communion as a body of Christ and we get quite a few regulars and we get people coming in and out because life is busy uh, but we have seen things happening now because of those times that we've gathered on Saturday nights Amen. is it difficult yes I mean, to give up your every Saturday, and I've been there every single Saturday except for when I went to El Paso in June. So that's giving up your Saturdays. And I know that we have family events, we have uh, appointments and various things like that. And it's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that we choose to make, you know, and we let others know that too. There's events that I've missed in the family say, no, that's the night that I go to pray. And Virginia goes as, as representing us to those events, but I'm here and committed to God. Uh, my view at this point in life is that there's a work to be done and family at this point, because they're all now moved out, they're not a part of my immediate family, you know, is not as important as the work of God at this point in my life. So, so I put more emphasis on that uh, than anything else. Um, and we have seen God move. 
Uh, Paul is saying here, look, you're going to come against kings and magistrates and people in your life, and you don't want to fight in the flesh. Fighting in the flesh only leads to problems. And you see people get into fights, and the police are involved, and they take them both to jail. You know, it's better just to fight in the Spirit, fight through prayer, and then trust in God. So he's encouraging them to be prayer warriors, prayer warriors there. So he goes on, verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. You know, interesting that he says God, our Savior, because God is our Savior, and he's making a reference to Jesus being God here as our Savior. Um, and it's acceptable to him. Jesus is a prayer warrior. He would oftentimes go up into the mountains and pray for those around him. He was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross. He always was talking to the Father in communication. Paul said, pray without ceasing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. Pray without ceasing. So prayer should be utilized in our lives for every situation. We must become women and men of prayer. So it's acceptable. Then he goes on and says, uh, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? Now, if we're arguing with unbelievers and we are battling in the flesh, how will they be saved? <clears throat> they won't. They really won't because they'll have a bad taste of Christianity. But if we pray for them, if, even if they disagree with us or persecute us, in this time, uh, the Judaizers were persecuting the church, the religious men. So instead of battling them, why not just pray for them and maybe God will save their souls. And that's really what God desires, that all men would be saved and come to know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. So there's more power in saving someone's life by prayer than by battling them in the flesh. So much more opportunity there. And, and we need to um, take those opportunities. So he says, who desires all men to be saved. And then he, he makes this great statement that's very clear. And Paul understood what Jesus was saying in John chapter 14, verse 6. He says, for there is one God. How many gods? One. one God. One mediator between God and men. How many mediators? One. One, not two. Now, as the Catholic Church would say that Mary is a mediator between God and Jesus, no, it just says one mediator. Uh, the Bible doesn't lie. If there were two, Paul would have said, there are two mediators. You can also go through Mary uh, to get to the Father. But that's not what he said. There's only one mediator between God and man. And who is it? The man, Christ Jesus. He makes it very clear. It is Jesus who's a mediator. It is Jesus who died on the cross. It is Jesus who gave his life willingly. It is Jesus that was the sacrifice. It is Jesus who's God himself in the flesh. So there's only one. There's only one God. Uh, not like the Mormons who say there are many gods. Uh, not like the Jehovah Witnesses who say that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. No, he's God. And he's our Savior. Amen. Now, Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, if you don't believe Paul, let's go to the source. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can get to the Father except through me. Again, not through Mary, not through a saint, not through a pastor. You know, you can go right to the Father through Jesus Christ. And this is why we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. because it's in his name that we're coming to the Father. And so we don't need Mary. Mary was wonderful. She was great. She'll be remembered. She's in scriptures. Uh, but she also said in Luke chapter 2 that she needed a Savior. And so needing a Savior meant that she was a sinner and she needed saving. And she surrendered her heart to Jesus Christ. So she's not a mediator. Only Jesus is. And he made that very clear. So there shouldn't be any issues. How many scriptures do we need to prove a truth? Just one. Just one. And we got two there. The same truth is, is there too. You can go back to Isaiah 43, 45. <clears throat> they talk about there being only one God and how there will never be any other gods besides him uh, at all. So there's only one God and that God is Jesus Christ. So he goes on, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. 
for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So it was God who appointed Paul to be an apostle and a preacher. Uh, and he obviously has been um, questioned here. And so he says, I'm not telling you a lie here. This is the truth. This is what God has done in my life. He's made me a teacher to the Gentiles uh, in faith and in truth. Therefore, so in light of this, verse eight, I desire that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Um, that doubting means human reasoning or questioning. In other words, when you pray, just pray by faith that God hears your prayer and that he will answer it according to his will. Now, you might take this verse and say, wow, God wants us praying everywhere for everything. <clears throat> and I've seen people do that. <clears throat> they could be standing in front of somebody who's questioning, maybe a police officer, and they'll stop and they'll go, I'm just gonna pray right now. And they start praying to the Lord right in front of them. I've seen that. I've seen people be very bold with their prayer, going to court, if they go into court for whatever reason, praying before the judge, you know, before he starts and they bow their head and they're praying. There have been times when I've been in situations and under my breath, I'm praying, Lord, give me wisdom. Lord, help me in this situation. There are some that take this scripture and they take it literally and they're praying everywhere, you know, um, wherever they go. We oftentimes pray as we're out here in the courtyard and we pray for the homes that are across the street. You know, we pray for the people that are in there. We pray for the people in our community. So praying everywhere is important. And he's encouraging the men especially. He wants men to be prayer warriors. Why? Because men are the leaders of their home. They're the leaders of the homes. They should be initiating the prayer <clears throat> before the meal, before you eat and you're sitting down as a family. They should say, let's bow our heads and let's pray. And they should pray for the food. They should pray for their family. They should be in prayer constantly. Um, God has called men to do that, and I appreciate those men that, that are prayer warriors. So, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation and not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Um, he goes on, let me finish the period. But, which is proper for women professing godliness uh, with good works. Now, understand the culture of the time. Paul is not talking in the sense literally that women uh, should not braid their hair at all or they shouldn't wear gold or pearls or costly clothing. Uh, he's not saying that. He's saying dressed appropriately. Dressed appropriately. Um, and, we, and women should. <clears throat> they should not dress provocatively in church. Church is a place where you dress appropriately. You dress appropriately where you're at. You know, and I've dealt with this, this scripture before. Uh, some like, well, we shouldn't wear makeup. We shouldn't wear jewelry. Shouldn't. And some churches go that way. A lot of the Pentecostal churches have their dresses all the way up here. In fact, when I first got saved, I kind of took that that way. And I remember <clears throat> the, the beginning of our uh, relationship with Christ was kind of like that. I, Virginia started buying dresses that came up to here and they were long all the way to the floor, and, you know, and things like that. And we realized that Paul was talking to a culture at that time where prostitution <clears throat> was big and they would braid their hairs. They would wear jewelry. And so people would look at them and say, oh, there's a prostitute. And so Paul's saying, look, just dress appropriately. Don't go out of your way. And then all of a sudden people mistake you, you know, don't, don't stick out. Be moderate <clears throat> and so forth. Now, now, there's a lot here in just that verse because there's been so much controversy and we have to have grace, but yet we have to understand. Um, if you have a function like, let's say, the beach and, and the youth all go out there, then you dress modestly according to um, the culture at that time. So sometimes the girls will wear bathing suits, one piece, or sometimes they'll wear two piece. It should be appropriate. It shouldn't be too far gone like they wear today. So that's important, but at the same time, they can wear, you know, bathing suits. 
um, shorts, you know, those kind of things you have to ask yourself, you know, are they appropriate? Now we have to understand that there are new believers that come into church, come into uh, classes that church are offering and they come in not knowing the scriptures and they'll come in dressed provocatively because that's how the culture uh, dresses today. I remember going to a class at Pastor Chuck's church. Um, what was the class? And I think the class was on being born again and I wanted to go through it. <clears throat> and I remember a lot of young people going through there and women going through there oh, basically with shorts and a bathing suit top. You know, and I was like, whoa, just really caught back by it. But then I understood afterwards that these people weren't Christians and they were trying to understand what, what who God was, what Jesus did and so forth. So we as believers have to understand that and not be you know, uh, rigid and become religious, you know, like, oh, how dare you, you know, kind of do that and have grace and mercy. But at the same time, the ladies need to be careful how they're, they're dressing too. So I hope that makes sense and there's a balance there because you don't want to go too extreme either in both directions. Verse 10, but which is proper for women professing godliness and good works. Let a woman learn in silent with all submission. Okay, very clear, right? Yay. Very clear. <laughs> <laughs> and all the guys go, amen. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that Paul says here, let the woman learn in silent, which means quiet and, or peaceable. And yet the women are the ones that love to socialize and talk the most. Isn't that interesting? Men don't like to talk so much. I mean, there's a few guys that you'll get that just have this gift of gab, but women can just go on from one subject to the next. I don't know if you ever, ever uh, as a guy, uh, listen to a woman, but they can go from one subject to the next, and you're like back on the first subject trying to figure it out, and they're already on another subject, you know, and they're all over the place, and they can go and go and go. And those of you that know my wife is She's the expert uh, on, on talking and changing stories and going on forever and ever and ever. Um, is that what Paul is talking about? No, <laughs> not at all. And it says with all submission. Again, uh, a lot of times the culture uh, here within the churches were in synagogues or small buildings. And so it couldn't hold a whole lot of people. You know, there, if we had 200 people, our church couldn't hold 200 people in here. We could hold maybe 70 in here, maybe a little more if we push the chairs all together. So there's a point where some people are gonna to have to be out in the courtyard, and that's what was happening here. Some of the people would be out in the courtyard, the culture was the men were the leaders of the home, the men would be taught, then the men would go home and teach their wives and their families what, what they were taught. And so some of the ladies that were outside were saying, honey, what did he say? I can't hear him. You know, and so Paul's saying, look, they need to be quiet while the message is going on. We do that today for everybody, right? If you're in church, no distractions. We don't want distractions because people want to hear the word of God. They're hoping to hear a word from the Lord. <clears throat> you know, they could be going through a very hard time and they've been praying and seeking God and they just want God to give them an answer. And they're coming here and they're listening and paying attention. Their hearts are right because they've worshiped. And, and all of a sudden they're hearing the message and then someone starts, you know, doing something that's causing attention to themselves or standing up and going to the back and then coming back and it distracts them and they miss what God has said. So we have to be aware of that. We have to be aware of our surroundings. We have to be aware that we're not the only ones in the church. There's others there that really want to, you know, understand. And sometimes children are in the church. And so a lot of times Calvaries uh, don't allow children in the church. They ask that they go to the classrooms and be taught appropriately. That, I remember that back in the 90s, actually possibly 87, 89, right around there. That was a big issue for a lot of Calvaries because people were saying, how dare you not allow our children to come inside the sanctuary to worship Jesus? And that's not what they were doing. But yet they get offended. They get narcissistic, so selfish that they, they can't see beyond their nose, you know, and they start feeling like they're accused of things. And, and, and so instead of understanding, first of all, your toddler, you know, your elementary age, kid is not going to be able to understand what the preacher is saying. So it is better that they go to class 
and be taught at their age the appropriate things so that they do have an understanding. So we're not trying to keep them from Jesus. We're trying to help them to get to Jesus a little bit more. And they can become a distraction when a little kid is jumping from chair to chair, you know, and making noise. And the mom's trying to hold it. And she's saying, shh, quiet. Everyone's trying to listen. And it's all distraction. So that's the reason. So understand that. You know, don't, don't get so defensive on, on these issues. There's other people around besides uh, ourselves too. So learn to be in silent, you know, learn to be submitted. And this would apply for us today in our culture for all of us when we're in church, not to be distractions. We will actually ask somebody that comes to church regularly and if they sit up in the front and they get up all the time in the middle of the service and then leave, we'll, start, we'll eventually ask them to sit in the back because we don't want them getting up in the middle of the service and then leaving. So they're no longer uh, asked to sit in the front, but to sit in the back. So if they have to leave, they make less distractions. And I think that if you know that <laughs> and you know your surroundings and you're aware of your surroundings, see a person that understands that I have to think about others and not just myself would say, you know what, I'm gonna sit in the back because sometimes I get up and I, I have to leave. And then if I leave, I'm gonna just go sit outside so I don't cause any distractions. You know, and do it slowly because there's people out there in the courtyard because we can't, you know, utilize every spot in here. We're full in here and they are sitting out there in the courtyard because they want to hear too. So it, it's all about working together and not causing distractions and not being nosy um, and letting God minister to the people. That's really what it's about. So don't, don't get offended if they ask you to sit in the back. Don't get offended that and in this church, if you leave, for whatever reason, go to the bathroom, then sit in the back when you come back in. We don't want you going all the way up to the front, sitting down, because again, a distraction. So be conscious of that. Think about others and not just your, yourself, you know. But I want to hear it too. Well, you just missed about 30 minutes because you were outside. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to hear it. Now, I've done this, and this is just me. I've had to go to the restroom, and you know what I do? I hold it because I don't want to be a distraction. And I'll hold it, and I'll hold it, and I'm like, okay, okay. And I'm trying to listen, you know, and as soon as he's done, boom, I'm out, and I'm ready to go, you know. Uh, as an adult, uh, you learn to hold it, <laughs> and your bladder gets bigger, <laughs> and you're able to hold more. And I get it, but just, you know, work through those things because we don't want to be a distraction. Uh, he also says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silent I was hoping that we'd be done by now so I didn't have to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the scripture that we use as Calvary Chapel and other churches use to talk about women having authority in the church, women being pastors. Um, he goes on and gives us the reason, verse 13 to 15, for Adam was formed first in Eve, and in Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So the reason that Paul says this is because women are gullible more than men. Now, I get it today in our society that there are some men that are gullible. You know, but generally speaking, Paul is saying it was a woman that was tempted first. They are moved by emotions and their feelings, and you cannot be in ministry and be moved by your emotions and feelings. You have to go by faith. You have to go by what the Word says no matter what. It was interesting, I was at the hospital last night in <clears throat> emergency room with my mom, and there are a lot of sick people there, and there's this one lady there, an African-American woman, and she's in a wheelchair, and she's just, you know, healed over, just crying, like, I'm in pain, I'm in pain, I'm in pain. And these nurses and doctors are there, and they're just walking around doing their job. They're just doing their job. And I'm listening to her going, wow. It's like, no, I feel for her, you know, because, like, someone take her in. And they're just doing their job because they can't. There's priorities. There's rules. There's guidelines. And they have to go by that and not their emotions. If they went by their emotions, they'd be taking every single patient that started crying out. You know, I need help right now. Now, the problem is, is that sometimes there are patients that are really, really crying out. Now, this person started to get upset. 
and she went up to the front window and started banging on it. Help me, I need help, and screaming loud so everybody could hear. I need help right now, and you guys, blankety blank, don't care at all. I'm not, I'm not a black junkie. This is real stuff right now. That's how I could have a appendix bursting inside of me, and you don't care, and the guy's sitting right there just listening to her. And security came over and says, ma'am, you need to calm down. You need to be quiet. And she went back to, over to the seat crying and crying and crying. So. That's what it takes to run an emergency room, you know? And it's very difficult. And you're sitting on the outside looking at that and say, how insensitive, how, how wrong of them. They should have some compassion, but they do, but how do you give it out? There were some doctors that were passing by as she was doing that. And uh, I overheard one doctor says, you can't do anything. Let's just go, you know, because they're already there. You can't do much more than what they're doing, so let's just go. And I was, don't get emotionally tied in there. Obviously, the lady was getting emotional. She goes, I should go help. And he's like, you can't do anything. You know, let's go. We've got other patients that we have to deal with, too. So pastors are the same way. You know, they have to deal with the word and not with the emotions and the feelings as hard as it is. And believe me, I've been doing this for 30 years. Generally speaking, the women are the very emotional part of the marriage. Very emotional. And they go on emotions and their feelings. But I, as soon as you start saying, I feel like this, I feel like that, that's the problem. You feel. You can't go by feelings. You have to go by what the Word of God says, by faith. And believe what God says more than your feelings say. And that was Eve's problem, right? She believed the lie. Instead of saying, no, God said this, I'm not going to believe you. Because she felt like, oh, maybe I could be like God. Maybe I could be, you know, this or that. And so this is the reason Paul said, no, he doesn't permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. And that is pastoring a church. Now, are there women pastors in churches? Yep, there are. I sat in my Greek class with four other women, and three of them were studying to be pastors. And when Justin brought up the idea of women pastoring, oh boy, you heard it from them. Oh, how dare you? You can't use that text. God can use any of us. What about Deborah? That's so out of context. Deborah's not even talking about pastorate. She took a place, she took a place of a warrior, somebody that actually was battling on behalf of Israel, a judge. You can have a woman judge. Paul doesn't say you can't be a judge, but a pastor is different. Teaching men is different. You can maybe be a, a, a woman pastor to women, and some women can do that, but not in a church. This is what I believe the Bible says here. Um, and I think that it's, it's pretty clear. But I think that we have women that, again, because of their emotions, they're moved by that. No, no one's going to tell me I can't do this, so I'm going to do it anyway. Um, <clears throat> Nevertheless, notice in 15, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and self-control. Now, uh, you would say, well, I thought she was saved by Jesus alone not through childbearing. That's not what he's talking about. Uh, the tense is, is that the woman will be reminded through childbearing that the seed that would come and crush the enemy would save her, the Messiah. So that's what it's saying here, that, that if she continues to walk like any of us, we must walk with the Lord, abide in Christ, John chapter 15, and he'll abide in us, that we'll be saved. Mm -hmm. That's all it's saying here. It's not saying that, that she'll be saved because she has a baby. No, not at all. It's a reminder of the Messiah that is to come because God told Eve that you'll have a child that will come that will crush the head of the serpent. That was a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And so through childbirth, the Messiah came into the world to save humanity. And so Paul ends on that note. I know that's difficult. I don't have the time to exhaust upon that. So uh, maybe look up my, our, my messages on my website, Calvary Chapel Inland, and I may have some messages there uh, for you. But until we get there, we'll get in deeper. So do some research. It, it'd probably be good to do research and see uh, what you find there. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank you for, for joining us and being a part of this study, and I pray God will, will bless you. Father, bless your people, Lord. Encourage them and strengthen them today, Lord, on this Good Friday, Father. And we thank you, Lord, that our Savior died on the cross for us, Lord, so that we could have eternal life. And we need to put our faith and our trust in him alone, for he alone is God. He alone is the mediator between God and man. And we come to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Bless us, Lord. 
Lead us and guide us today, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you have any prayer requests, please post them or private message me, and we will pray for you. Have a wonderful day.